On today's program, I interview Stefan Verstappen. Stefan Verstappen is the author of several books, including The Art of Urban Survival, Defense Against the Psychopath, The 36 Strategies of Ancient China, and his newest book, A Master's Guide to the Way of the Warrior. In today's presentation, Stefan and I discuss meditation and how it can apply to your life for many aspects, from your job to your love life to spirituality, health, fitness to a skill. Stefan shares techniques on how to achieve states of meditation easier, states of relaxation. To learn more about Stefan Verstappen and to order one of his great books, especially his newest one, A Master's Guide to the Way of the Warrior, visit chinastrategies.com. Stefan Verstappen, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me back, Russell. Today we're going to talk about meditation. I think meditation is great, but I don't really know what it is, right? What am I supposed to be saying to myself? Am I supposed to be contemplating my navel? You know, I know what relaxation is. When I go to the sauna, I'm able to relax. Talk to us about what meditation is and what, what it's for. Well, uh, a lot of people don't know what meditation is. It's something that is bandied about all the time, especially in the whole new age um, world. And uh, to be honest with you, most people don't know what the hell they're talking about when they when they say meditation. But what does it mean? What are you doing? And, um, you know, I've been studying this for many years since I was at least well, 13. I started uh, getting into the whole new age and uh, meditation and yoga and all that. And uh, so I've studied it uh, for about 45 years. And quite frankly, most people don't understand what they're talking about when they say meditation. And the reason is because meditation is actually kind of complicated. What I like to do is um, I make I, I, I use the analogy that meditation is the same sort of term as exercise is. Um, so if somebody says, oh, well, I'm going to exercise. OK, um, we all know what the word means. But what what exercise are you doing? Are you running? Are you biking? Are you swimming? Are you doing Pilates? Are you doing yoga, Kung Fu? You know, exercise can embody or the term or the broad blanket term exercise can embody dozens and dozens of different types of techniques or, or activities that fall under the category of exercise. And so when people say meditation, uh, they often think that this is sort of like a singular thing. Oh, meditation, yes. Um, but actually, meditation embodies as many different types of activities as the term exercise would embody. So for me, when I was you know, uh, trying to, uh, and I, I delved through all these tomes on, on meditation and chakra and the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and I was a Rosicrucian, and I did astral projection and um, remote viewing and isolation tank and LSD and um, spirit trips into the woods. You know, I went through all of that stuff. But what I wanted to get back to, and, and that's because it's my nature, I, I, I like to be pragmatic. So what is it I'm doing and why am I doing it? And this is, I think, something that's often you know, lacking because it, you, you epitomized what it is um, when you said, well, you know, meditation, am I relaxing? Um, well, that's one one point of meditation. You can use meditation to relax, but there are uh, many different types of activities and goals and reasons for meditating, and they're all sort of different. So if we can say that meditation is simply exercising the mind and focusing inwards, whereas exercise is folk, uh, exercising or using the body to focus outwards. So anytime you want to focus inward to accomplish something, we can put that underneath the broad category of meditation. So, But what is the point of meditation? Well, uh, there's actually many points of meditation. One that you mentioned is relaxation. Yes, you can use meditation to relax. And there are, you know, a half a dozen meditation techniques uh, that are different from each other that you can use to relax. Um, you can use meditation to improve a skill. Let's say uh, you're a bowler or you, you play darts or tennis and you want to improve your tennis game. You can use meditation to improve the tennis game. 
Uh, you can Im- use meditation to improve a sense. Let's say you want to be able to see things better. M- maybe you're a painter and you want to be able to view a landscape, but you want to be able to view it in a way that is not the usual way you see things. Um, you can use meditation to alter your perception, to see things, to hear things, to sense and feel things that you would not normally feel and meditation can be used to enhance your perceptions whatever that perception is visual auditory taste smell um and and again meditation can be used to improve one of those uh um one of those skills you can also use meditation to um achieve a goal let's say you want to become you know vice president of your corporation Um, So meditation can be used to achieve that goal. So when you say meditation, it's it's a broad category. It refers to many different types of activities. And each one of those activities would have to have a specific goal. And um, this is why I I like to uh, break down all the different techniques by what is it you're trying to accomplish. So if you tell me what you want to accomplish, I can tell you which meditation technique to use to accomplish that. Stefan, I'm going to be on the Anthony Cumia show in June or July. I'm pretty nervous for it. It's in New York City. I'm going to be, you know, on camera, green screens behind me. There's like three or four cameras. There's a production booth there, an audience. Fairly nerve-wracking event. How do I prepare myself for this using meditation? Okay, now now we're getting into something that's even different from a skill set. So um, let me uh, let me give you an example first, and then I'll get back to your question. So they did studies in Russia. Um, they did uh, uh, um, they took people that played darts, and they had one group of people play darts every day, and they had another group of people imagine they play darts every day and they had a third group of people which would be the control group of course that didn't play darts at all and they tested their result their results and their scores and they found that the people that practiced and the people that imagined they practiced had the same amount of improvement so in other words it made no difference to your psychomotor skills whether you physically practiced the action of throwing a dart or whether you simply imagined practicing the throwing of a dart. So, and then they divided that group into, again, two different groups. This time they used two different types of visualization exercises. In the one group, they had the person practice throwing the darts using what would be called a first-person point of view. Now, this gets into the, you know, uh, it's very similar to the video games where you have a first-person role-playing game, right, where um, you're looking out the character's eyes, and when he raises his gun, you see the scope, and uh, you see your enemies, but you don't actually see your own body because you're looking through your eyes. So that's first-person. And then the third person is where your point of view or the point of view of the gamer is up and behind the actual character. So you see the character's full body and uh, you control what they do that way. So they discovered that with visualization, there's two ways of doing that. Um, You can imagine, you can visualize yourself in your body throwing the dart, or you can imagine yourself standing behind yourself throwing the dart. So again, they took two groups and then a control group, which did nothing. Um, and they had the first group imagine that they were throwing the dart physically themselves. And then they had the second group uh, imagine they were throwing the dart, but standing back, watching themselves throw the darts. And, they, and the results showed that the first group had a higher score. They had greater improvement. So they realized that for physical skills, the best way to improve it is to imagine doing it in the first person. Now, the third person still uh, allowed people to improve it because even using visualization in the third person was still as effective as actually physically doing it. So um, visualization is really an amazing technique, and it will allow you to do many things and improve skills that you could not possibly do in the real world. 
I'll give you an example. Let's say you want to uh, practice getting over your fear of heights. Now, there's a physical way of doing First of all, the basic technique for overcoming any phobia is called desensitization. Uh, desensitization, right? Progressive desensitization. So if you're afraid of heights, um, you start by practicing stepping on a, on a two foot board off the ground. And when you're relaxed doing that, you practice stepping on a, on a chair two feet off the ground. And when you're relaxed with that, you know, this is repeated until you no longer feel anxiety. Uh, and then you increase the height that you stand above the ground and, and uh, reduce your anxiety using relaxation techniques and anti-anxiety exercises. But once you've done that, you overcome your fear of heights or your fear of snakes or spiders, whatever it may be. You're introduced to the source of the fear in small doses until you become acclimatized to it. Uh, this is a principle that they call habituation, which means that an often repeated stimulus will start to lose its effect over time. This is why, you know, junkies need more uh, bigger fixes, especially money junkies and attention junkies, you know, they always need a bigger fix because they become desensitized to it. It no longer has the kick that it had the first time you did it. So you need more and more and more. And this is a result of habituation. So it's bad if you're a junkie because you always need more. But it's good if you have a phobia because you can use that same principle to overcome fears. So using visualization, then let's say you have a fear of of, of heights. You can, in your mind, imagine climbing up, say, um, off to the edge of a cliff and looking over the edge of a cliff, something that in real life would be terrifying and even dangerous. But if you do it mentally using imagination, it will have the same effect on your physiology as if you really did it physically. So visualization is a great technique. It falls under the category of meditation because a lot of these meditation techniques, when they when they talk about they're doing meditation, what they're actually doing is visualization, you know. Uh, for example, the people that are doing the, you know, the chakra meditations. Well, what are they doing with the chakra meditations? They're visualizing their chakras. And so if you build up this mental picture, it has the same effect on your body and on your mind as if you were to actually do it. So visualization, very important technique. <coughs> now for Going to the, uh, the recording studio and putting on a great show. Now, this is something a little bit different. You can use visualization, say, in the first person to uh, rehearse your lines. Like if you were an actor and you were going on stage, use the visualization to go through your lines and to, you know, find your spot on the stage and to monitor what your posture should be while you're delivering those lines. Um, I use that kind of meditation for my martial arts. I do the kata, the routine in my mind and in the first person. And uh, when I'm doing it, I try to bring as much reality and detail to it because the, the more reality and detail you can add to your visualization, the more powerful it becomes. So uh, for improving you know, physical skill, rehearse it mentally. And it's almost as good uh, as really rehearsing it physically. But there is a third form of uh, visualization, which is results oriented. So in this case, you don't imagine yourself actually doing it uh, from either a first po person point of view or even a third person point of view, but you imagine the end result of what you're doing. So for this type of meditation, for your, you know, going into the studio, what you should imagine is you being confident and walking in there with a bit of a swagger and feeling upbeat and smart and witty and meeting the the hosts and the guests and having a great conversation and laughing and being friends with everybody and putting on a great show and so you re imagine the results of your activity not just the it, the details of the activity itself you're not you know, visualizing what you're going to say, for example, you visualize that whatever you say is wonderful and um, that it will come to you when you're in the situation spontaneously and whatever comes to you spontaneously in that situation will be very clever and witty and everybody will love you. So those are the three types of visualization 
exercises that you can use to improve a skill, such as playing darts or playing music or martial arts or any type of physical skill you would like to improve. Uh, you can use the first person or third person visualization. But you can also use the result oriented version of it, which just means you imagine yourself being successful uh, and, and carrying on and doing a great job at what you're doing. And again, that will have, it sh you know, they, they've done the studies. They, they studied this with uh, uh, Olympic athletes. The Russians did that with their Olympic athletes. They, uh, you know, they did another exercise where they said, okay, now all we want you to do is imagine standing up and getting your gold medal. And you're on the podium and the audience is cheering and they, you know, place the medal around your neck and uh, you wave your hand to the crowd. That type of meditation also works or that type of visualization also improves uh, from their study statistically uh, improves your chances that that's how things are going to go. So we know <clears throat> the reverse of this is when we sabotage ourselves, right? You're going into a job interview you're worried, you know, your resume isn't good enough, you, you know, you didn't wear the right suit, um, your hair is not good, maybe you have bad breath, you should have uh, taken some, uh, some gargle with some uh, mouthwash. You know, you have all these fears and anxieties going into this job interview. Now, you're already visualizing this. So, therefore, if you have these fears going into the interview, you're sabotaging yourself because what you imagine is going to influence how things turn out. So if you're going to go for a job interview, you need to imagine yourself being sharp, uh, smart, come up with the, uh, the, the right answers at the right time, uh, be charming, knowledgeable, confident. And if you imagine that, that's how it will turn out. So w for your big trip to uh, New York, just imagine yourself being a professional, you're confident, uh, you know what you're doing, you've got the experience, people like you anyways, and whatever you do is just going to be great. Between you and I, I had been visualizing about getting that gig for months. Really? Even though I never asked him to be on the show, Yeah. I had been visualizing being on the Anthony Cumia show for probably three months. Well, there you go. And then out of nowhere, they invited me to be on. Yeah. You see, that's how this it, it's it's bizarre how this works, because, again, I'm very pragmatic. I'm not one that tends to think that, oh, you know, our thoughts are going to influence the universe or happy thoughts will make the bad people go away and all that nonsense. But so I'm I'm a hardcore skeptic. So when everything that I've put in my book, um, the way of the warrior and all this stuff is in my book there because as a as a warrior you need to know how to uh, your, your mind is a tool it's a weapon it's it's a lifesaver and so a warrior in order to survive in in our society needs all his tools all his uh, weapons honed and sharp and so your mind needs to be trained so that it's sharp as well but uh, i've never been one to believe in some sort of invisible force but i have to say there's something there there's something else going on and i can't exactly put my finger on it i can't give you an exact theory of why it works or how it works but i do know with the meditation techniques and what we just described about the visualization um it works for some reason so if you visualized this upcoming gig for three months, and suddenly the gig happened, I'm not surprised, Russell. So I think the big one is relaxation, mm -hmm. right? That's what everyone thinks about when they think of meditation. That's the yes. first thing they think about. Om Mani Padme Hum. Right. <laughs> this is why I asked. I, what am I supposed to be doing? What am I supposed to be thinking? So I'm transcending time and space, sitting there. What am I doing? Um, well, what is it you want to do? Do you want to transcend time and space? That's a different uh, technique altogether. Uh, well, I'm just trying to relax. Okay, so let's go back to the relaxation. So let's use the simplest and easiest way to relax, and that is behavioral conditioning. Um, there's several techniques, several exercises that you can use. I don't know if you – you like science fiction? Do you read science fiction, Russell? Yes. And you've read Dune? Yes. 
So you remember that one of the exercises that the Bene Gesserit was teaching Paul Ma did was to uh, focus on each individual muscle in order to control each muscle individually. Um, this is actually a real technique. Um, in order to relax, I, the, the easiest and most effective way and the fastest is behavioral conditioning. So what we're going to do is set up a conditioned stimulus and a conditioned response. So the conditioned stimulus would be a word phrase that you would choose ahead of time. So let's say cool moss. We're going to use that as a as a trigger. Now what I want to do is combine cool moss with relaxation techniques. So one way to do this is to you'd have to lie on your back in a comfortable position and then tense every muscle in your body you know like just your fingertips your face your your buttocks your stomach like you know when you're doing isometrics right you know, like just tense your entire body for about 10 seconds right just tense it up so that you're almost shaking from the tension then mentally repeat the stimulus cool moss and when you do that immediately relax go limp right and then uh, do that several times relax go limp uh, just feel heavy for a couple of minutes and then go back to the tension right get really tense and then again repeat the word or the phrase cool moss then go limp again now what that ha does is you do that several times and it's going to take you about a week <clears throat> if you um, do this, you know, maybe once or twice a day, you know, maybe in the morning, maybe before you go to bed, uh, just before you go to sleep is probably the best time to do it, right? While you're lying in bed, you tense up like that, and then you repeat the term cool moss, and then you relax, and then you go to sleep. Now, you do that once or twice a day. Within a week, what happens is the term cool moss, your body has been uh, – uh, conditioned programmed you're, you're programming yourself your body is programmed to relax when it hears you say to yourself cool moss so this is pavlov's dog you know pavlov rings the bell presents the food the dog starts to salivate we're using the same principle you know this is how the human body works this is how the physiology the brain works so it works against us but we can make it work for us uh, the advertisers and the powers that be are are using behavioral conditioning to, you know, make us stupid. But we can use behavioral conditioning to make us stronger and smarter. So if you do that, the behavior conditioned response is relaxation. Then any time you feel tense, just repeat the word to yourself, cool moss, and you will immediately start to relax. Um, another way to add to this is to visually go through your body from top to bottom, going over each muscle group independently and willing the muscle to relax. So you imagine that you're like coming up out of the water, right? Head first and then down through the shoulders and torso and, and buttocks and finally your legs and your feet. So when you're lying in bed, uh, first imagine <clears throat> the muscles of your face, right? Because a lot of times tension is insidious. We are unaware that we're tense. And I got this a lot when I was teaching martial arts. You know, I would say, okay, you know, go into a reverse punch position and they would assume the posture and, oh my God, their shoulders were up around their ears. And I would say, relax. And they would say, oh, I am relaxed. I said, okay. And then I would go and I'd push down on their shoulders. And it wasn't until I pushed down on their shoulders that they realized that their shoulders were really hunched up. They didn't perceive it. They didn't see it. So in your mind, you think you're relaxed, but your body is showing tension that you are unaware of. So one way to work on that is to lie in bed or lie down somewhere comfortable and mentally go over each muscle group individually. So you might be tense and so your face is frowning or you're clenching your teeth or you're squinting, right? So you need to focus on your face and go over each muscle group. Uh, go over the eyes and mentally tell your eyes to relax. Stop squinting. Stop frowning. You know, check the muscles in your jaw. Uh, imagine them becoming loose and relaxed. You're no longer clenching your teeth. 
you're not grimacing, you're not frowning, and you have to do that. And when you do that, again, repeat the conditioned stimulus that you chose ahead of time, cool moss, and say the word cool moss as you mentally focus on that muscle group and mentally force, or not force it, but will that muscle to relax. And, and this is a little bit more detailed, but it doesn't take that long. 15 minutes and you're through the whole body, right? So first we start with the face. Cool moss. Okay, relax the eyes. Okay, cool moss. Relax the jawline. Cool moss. Relax the muscles in the back of your neck. Right? And feel them uh, relax. And again, we can use visualization here. We can imagine, you know, if you're a guitar player, imagine tuning down the string, right? Relaxing, uh, loosening the string, right? So if you're thinking about the muscles in your neck, imagine that you're releasing the tension. You're turning down the tension on the strings, on those muscles. And as you're doing that, you're repeating the term cool moss. Then the trapezius muscles, then your deltoids, uh, your 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 uh, uh, triceps, your biceps, your uh, flexor carpi. You go down the body, right? And then your pectorals, your, your, your dominus rectus muscles, your gluteus maximus. You relax each major muscle group independently, and you do so by focusing your attention on those muscles, repeating the conditioned stimulus, which is cool moss, and using visualization. And you can use a number of ways to visualize it. You can imagine uh, the muscles getting warm. You can imagine uh, wax melting. You can imagine loosening, loosening the guitar string, toning down the tension. So in this way, we combine a number of different techniques. We combine visualization. We combine behavioral conditioning um, to relax the body. Now, you do that, <clears throat> and after oh, a month, You've mastered it. Anytime you are ever tense, just repeat that uh, that code word to yourself, and it will go away instantly, and it will stay with you for life. It's a little bit detailed. It's a little bit complicated, but that's what I mean. You know, like people say, people say, "Oh, well, I'm going to meditate." Well, what are you what are you doing? You know, what exactly is the technique? What is your what do you hope to get out of it, you know? And so the relaxation, it's really important in martial arts because if you are tense in a fight, you are going to lose. That's why, you know, you've heard the saying that when drunks get into a car accident, it's the drunk that survives, right? Well, why is it the drunk driver that survives? Well, because he's relaxed. And when you're relaxed, you can absorb the blows easier. Uh, you don't get hurt and you don't overextend yourself, and you don't rip a muscle when you go to kick somebody, and also, you're faster. You can't move quickly if you're tense. So relaxation is a key ingredient in martial arts, and especially in a fight, because everybody gets tense in a fight, right? Like somebody's going to punch you in the face. Everybody gets nervous. They, the, the, you know, the hair rises up, your shoulders ride up, you tense up. All that tension is going to sabotage you and kill you in a fight. So it's super important to be able to relax on command whenever you are a martial artist or a warrior. Um, whether it's you get into a fight, whether it's, uh, um, you know, you're, you're falling off your bicycle. And in that moment when you're traveling through the air and you're wondering if you're going to land on your head or your shoulder, you will be relaxed enough to tuck and roll. Because I fell, fell off my bike dozens of times going down mountains, and, and I've never, never been hurt because of my martial arts training. I know break falls, and uh, every time I've gone face forward over the handlebars, I've always tucked and rolled, and I end up coming, usually rolling out of it and landing on my feet again. You know, you can't do that if you're tense. For people that don't know what they're doing, and the first time they go face forward over the handlebars, they're going to tense up, they're going to face plant. And in and, and best case scenario, they're going to break their neck, you know. So you always have to stay relaxed and fluid. This is what helps you to absorb impacts. This is what helps you become fast and helps you to think. So it's really important to be able to relax. It's not just, oh, you know, I've had a tough day at work. I need to relax. Yeah. Then, you know, some of these other meditation techniques where they just kind of sit and breathe a little bit. Okay, I guess that's okay for that situation. But if you really want to be a master of relaxation and be able to relax on command so that you can 
survive a fight, survive a car accident, survive a bike accident, survive a job interview, you know, any of those situations where you're automatically going to get tense and that tension is going to work against you, then you need to get into a little bit more depth with the meditation technique. And again, in my book, I outline very clearly this whole chapter on on uh, relaxation and I describe the, uh, the releasing the bowstring technique, which is uh, the name of the, the first one where you get really tense, you know. And it's like drawing the, the string back on a bow, right? And then at the apex of your pull, of your draw, just before you release the arrow, that bow has the most amount of tension it can take. Then you release the arrow, instantly all that tension is dissipated. So that's the first technique we talked about. And then the guided imagery going through the behavioral conditioning technique by physic, uh, mentally going through each muscle group, relaxing them, and, and using visualization to imagine the muscles getting soft and warm and relaxed. And you practice that and you condition yourself for that response. It's a little bit more complicated than when most people say meditation, but it's not that complicated. It really isn't. And anybody can study this, learn it easy. It's easy. I explain it very clearly what to do. And you do that for a month. And then any time you need to relax, um, you would just go cool moss all right? or whatever term you want to use. And you will instantly relax. And not only that, once you have developed the habit of instantly relaxing when you're facing danger, it will happen automatically. It takes a few years. <clears throat> it takes a few years uh, of, of practicing this, of developing it, but it eventually becomes instinct. And, you know, uh, it's one of the greatest techniques in the world is to be able to instinctively relax and stay cool when all about you, they're losing their heads, right? You're the one that stays cool and stays frosty, and it becomes a part of you. It's your nature now. It's your training, and you won't lose it after that point. It's always there, and that's, that's an amazing skill. Okay, let's do one more, Stefan. Uh, sense. I noticed that you wear glasses, but uh, can you improve your eyesight or your hearing using meditation? Oh, absolutely. Um, I worked with the blind and uh, I, I was teaching martial arts and I got this phone call from a woman and she was asking me some weird questions and she says, well, can you pick me up and drive me to class? I'm going, what? nobody's ever asked me to come and pick them up until I realized there was something wrong with her. And it turned out, I said, I said, do you have a disability? And she says, yes, I'm actually, I'm blind. Will you still teach me? Now, I, of course, I said yes, because, I, you know, in theory, you know, we've seen the movies, you know, you've seen the the TV series Kung Fu and the blind master Po, you know. Um, Zatoichi. Yeah, and Zatoichi, right? Uh, the blind swordsman from the Japanese uh, movies. So in theory, it seems possible. But I, I don't know anybody that's ever taught the blind. I have never met a blind martial artist at that point. And so... I really delved into a lot of these meditation techniques when I started teaching her. I said, okay, come to class. I said, we'll, we'll see what we can do. I don't know if I can teach you anything, but we'll experiment. You'll be my guinea pig, and we'll do it together, and we'll see if we can develop techniques. So um, we did end up developing some amazing techniques. It's uh, it, it's unbelievable. What Here's what it is, is that, and uh, Aldous Huxley wrote this. No, was it Aldous Huxley? He said, we, uh, we develop a skill until it's adequate and then we stop. And um, no, Alexander Groen. Uh, uh, anyways, and, and, and that's what happens. We all kind of develop a skill until it's, you know, it suits our needs. And then we stop developing it. But there's actually ways of improving your, your, your senses that are far beyond what we have normally accustomed to. Um, for example, you, you, you know, you develop the ability to, to see, you know, 20 feet ahead of you and okay, that's fine. But actually, if you were to develop what's called far seeing, um, you could develop your eyes to focus on objects many miles distance. We don't because we never use that skill. We are always sitting in front of a computer screen, which is two feet away, or we're sitting behind the wheel of a car, but we're never looking more than, you know, 10 yards ahead of us. You know, we spend 98% of our life looking 
at a range within 10, 20 feet. We're not actually trying to look at things 10 miles away, even though we can see things 10 miles away. The human eye is, is a very uh, precise instrument, and it's uh, one of the most effective uh, 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 structures of the animal kingdom. We have trichromatic vision, and we can see as far away as a hawk or an eagle. We don't because we don't develop it. Uh, another thing is sense of hearing. Um, uh, I, I describe exercises to improve your sense of hearing because one thing you know would be helpful is because your your vision is only about uh, 160 degrees, right? But hearing is 360 degrees, so it is sort of like our radar system. We can tell what's going on around us in a circle. But we can't really tell. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're walking down a dark alley. Now you hear footsteps behind you. Can you tell if it's one person, two persons, three persons, four persons? Can you tell if they're men or women? And can you tell if they're ready to attack you? You can. Uh, most of us can't. And the only reason we can't is because we never tried to learn the difference. Um, so what I did with the uh, with my blind student is one of the things we did is what I called our walking lessons, and I would simply walk with her down the street, and it was a small town, and we'd walk down the street, and and I'd ask her, okay, where are you now? Um, what do you mean, where am I now? Listen to the surroundings. Tell me where you are. So then she would listen, and she, wait a minute, she hears the gas pump. There's a gas station on the corner, and on the other side, there's a, a play school, and she can hear the kids at recess, and they're yelling and screaming. And so now she knows where she is because she recognized the location of these different sounds. Like most of us will walk down the street, yeah, we hear all kinds of things around us. We don't perceive it because we're not trained to pick up on it, and we don't need to pick up on it, so we don't. So we have no ability to tell where we are based on auditory signals alone, but it doesn't mean you can't. You simply focus on listening and identifying the sounds within an environment so that you can use those sounds to t gather a lot more information of what's going on around you. So we continue walking, and I would say, oh, is there somebody behind us? And she would stop and she would listen. She says, yeah, I hear somebody. I said, who? Well, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I said, well, listen, listen. And then I would identify what the sounds were. I said, that's a woman walking behind us. Oh, okay. Or that's a man walking behind us. Okay. Or that's two kids. You do that enough times and then you are able to identify the sounds clearly. It's... It's really not rocket science. I mean, nobody has ever trained us how to distinguish the sound of a man walking from the sound of a woman walking. But if you listen for it and you are reinforced with the truthful answer of what you're hearing, then quickly you are able to tell the difference. So it got to the point where she was able to know where she was in town if she had to go shopping based on the sounds around her. There was a river downtown. Uh, if, the, if, the, if the sound of the water is, is very far away, she knows how far away she is. As the sound of the water gets louder, she knows how close she is. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a hundred different auditory landmarks in your environment that you can use. And she even got good enough to the point where she could chase me around the dojo with a stick. Because she wanted to do sword fighting. I said, sword fighting. I said, you know, uh, Angie, I don't think I can teach you sword fighting. No, I want to learn. So I got a bunch of padded swords, and I, I taught her some of the techniques, and uh, especially like the figure eight, the twirling sword. And um, based on the sound of my footsteps on the tatami, she could chase me around the dojo, swinging that sword. I was in fear of my life because, I mean, <laughs> she couldn't stop herself from hitting me if I wasn't able to defend myself or evade her, right? Because she's blind. She's winging, swinging this sword around, and I'm running away from her, and she's chasing me. She could follow me through a dojo, swinging this damn sword over her head, and she would have clocked me if I, if I wasn't, you know, the, the great master that I am. <laughs> so... These are the things that we can do. We have sensory abilities that we are, uh, we don't use. It, we are capable of it, but because we've never been trained 
in that method, we don't use them. So how to use meditation? Let's take one example uh, and what I used earlier with hearing. There's an exercise that I call uh, extended hearing. And you sit in, in a comfortable position. You do the relaxation, the you know, some deep breathing. And, uh, and then what you do is you focus your attention. You close your eyes and you focus on listening to everything within a six-foot radius of you. So if there's a leaf, if there's a bird, if there's a butterfly, your own heartbeat, you can hear your own heartbeat. You can even hear the sound of your blood rushing through your arteries when you're in an environment that's quiet enough. So focus your hearing inwards first and then outwards, everything within six feet. And then extend that radius 12 feet. What's in front of you at 12 o'clock? What's behind you at 6 o'clock? If you hear something... Maybe it's a squirrel in, in, in the leaves. They make a lot of noise, right? It could, bears don't make as much noise as squirrels do, you know. And so if you hear something, you don't know what it is, open your eyes, turn around and look. What was that? Oh, I didn't know that squirrels could make so much noise. So then close your eyes again and continue expanding that ring 12 feet, 30 feet, quarter mile, and then infinity. So when you're sitting there, and, and it's great to do this outdoors, you can hear, you know, whatever's around you, the insects, the birds, the little animals. You can hear what's, you know, a couple of miles away, the sound of city traffic, um, a train whistle blowing in the distance. And even if you're out in the country and you expand your auditory awareness to infinity, you can actually hear this kind of rumble, this weird... It's kind of a, a weird sound that cities from a distance make this weird harmonic noise, you know, but you can tell where you are in the world from the auditory information that you're picking up. The cities, the, the people, the traffic, the nature, the wind in the trees, all of this provides a big picture, a very cl clear picture of your reality, of you in this time and place. And again, it's, it's, it's a method of Meditation, because you're focusing inwards on a signal. You're isolating one of the signals that your brain receives, because we receive a lot of signals, uh, auditory, touch, taste, smell, temperature, um, but we're drowning out the other, you know, that's why we're closing our eyes. Uh, we don't want uh, visual information to override the audio information, so we close our eyes, we focus on hearing, and the richness, the texture, and you're a musician, Russell, so you know what I mean when you, when I say there are levels of sound that interact with harmonies, uh, level upon level of harmonies that is like a whole world, right? That people that aren't a musician might not be able to see or hear this, this, this symphony, but because you're focused on the auditory, because you're focused on, and you have experience listening. Because when you're a musician, you have to listen. You have to be able to tune your instrument. If you can't listen, you can't even tune your instrument, right? So you have to be able, you train yourself to hear things that people that don't train themselves won't hear. So that's uh, one example of using meditation to improve a sensory uh, uh, function. But you know what? You can also use a similar technique to train your sense of direction and you can also you know one of the things i always wondered about is you hear these stories about martial arts masters that they could walk into a room and they would sense when somebody was ready to jump from behind them right part of that is again <clears throat> uh, the auditory information because not only are you listening for things that are there you're listening for things that aren't there. You know, you're same thing when we use visual techniques. Yes, we're looking at the environment, but there's another technique in which you don't see what you're looking at, but instead you focus only on the shadows those things project. Uh, this is an exercise that Aldous Huxley uh, talks about in his book, The Art of Seeing, in which he describes going from a clinically blind condition to being able to see uh, without glasses and only needing reading glasses. And he did it all through eye exercises. And most of those eye exercises involved, again, meditation, because when you focus the mind inward, that's meditation. So 
with the auditory, how can you tell if somebody is sneaking up behind you, even if they are absolutely quiet? Because I tried this with my blind student. I would say, okay, you stand here. I'm going to sneak up on you. And I, I want you to tell me what direction I'm coming from and how far away I am. So she would stand in the room and in front of her is 12 o'clock and behind her is 6 o'clock. And I'm good at moving silent. I'm like a cat. You know, I move like the wind. Um, so I would sneak up and I did not make a noise. And she could still say, you're at eight o'clock, six feet away. And I would say, yes. No, she made a mistake the first few times, right? She would say, oh, maybe you're 12 o'clock. I said, no, I'm at two o'clock. Oh, okay. So you reinforce correct signals and you, you know, and you correct mistaken uh, perceptions. It doesn't take a lot, a couple of hours, you know. After a week, you become a master at this. It's not really rocket science. It's very simple, but you do have to do it, you know. So how are you able to tell when I sneak up on you? It's not because I'm giving off noise, but my body is absorbing background noise. So what I'm doing is casting what I call an auditory shadow. Just like if you're with your eyes closed and you're facing the sun and somebody walks in front of you, you didn't see them, but you noticed that uh, a dark shadow passed over your eyes, right? It's the same with the auditory signals. So if you want to be a martial arts master and you want to be able to detect when somebody is sneaking up behind you, it's not just what to listen for. It's but what's missing from the audio landscape, because there is a certain background noise everywhere we go in the world. Right. There's the sound of the machinery, the fridge, the, the office next door, the traffic on the street. Now, if I stand beside you and you have your eyes closed, even if I'm not making a sound, my body is absorbing the background noise and it will cast that shadow and you'll be able to tell that I'm standing beside you. Stephen Verstappen, we've run out of time. Love having you on the show. We'll have you back on again, of course. Tell the audience uh, how they can learn more about you and perhaps even get in touch with you. Also, what book are some of these meditation uh, tips in? Well, everything I spoke about, all the meditation exercises, the sensory enhancement, the relaxation, it's all in my book, The Master's Guide to the Way of the Warrior. And, uh, and it explains it in a very clear and easy to follow manner on how to improve all of your senses, how to relax, and uh, how to develop that kind of instinct, you know, to do the right thing in the right situation. And that's in, uh, you can get that book on Amazon and Kindle and uh, Lulu, and um, you can go to my website, uh, chinastrategies.com, and you can order the book. If you order through my website, um, I give you a $5 discount by uh, cutting out Amazon. <laughs> Stefan Verstappen, always a pleasure. we got to wrap it up, my friend. Thank you so much for being a guest on the program. Anytime, Scott. Uh, Russell, thanks. Let me try that again. Anytime, anytime, Russell. Thanks very much for having me on again.